Having said that, I have something for you, and it is not going to be a long message. It is not. But something at the core of my heart, and I believe it's at the core of, it'll be at the core of your heart also somewhere, but it definitely is at the core of God's heart. I want to talk to you about greatness. And many definitions of greatness, but, you know, I don't know how many of you have watched uh, ESPN's uh, The Last Dance. Probably all of you have watched it, or some of you have, or some of you are hearing it for the first time. So ESPN, the sports cha channel, they did, did a series on the Chicago Bulls. Chicago Bulls, as some of you may not know, it's a basketball team. They did really well in the 90s. 80s, they were up at the top. 90s, they were the best. The series is about the whole team, Chicago Bulls, but primarily focusing around Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan's one of the greatest basketball players, in my opinion, ever. These days, you have LeBron James and uh, the late Kobe Bryant, you know. So these days, kids who have not seen Michael Jordan or MJ, you will always wonder, oh, I think LeBron is better than Michael Jordan or... Uh, the late Kobe Bryant is better. It doesn't matter. If you have a chance, please go watch the series. It's awesome. I mean, my kids are wondering, how am I watching it like back to back? Uh, you know, they're like, so much TV? <laughs> so it is so intriguing uh, as to how one man, the determination of one man can change the destiny of a team. Amazon Prime has a series on who built America, the men and women who built America. It features uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who built railroads you know, back 200, almost uh, 150, 200 years ago. Rockefeller, who is the oil magnet. Ford, Henry Ford, is streamlined manufacturing. Andrew Carnegie, who is the father of steel companies in the US. J.P. Morgan, the modern financial system inventor. And many other iconic men. So all these men, as I'm speaking, I want to explain. These are guys who did something extraordinary. Something extraordinary. There are other people that we already know of. Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison. Oh, these are quite famous people, but they did something to get there. You know, I always uh, am careful when I say uh, great people, and I'm you know, just throwing out a list of names, and all of them are men. I'm sure there'll be some questions. What about women? There are women also. Yes, of course, there are women. Have you heard of Queen Elizabeth I from the 15th century? She called herself the Virgin Queen because she chose to marry a country instead of a man. Now, during Queen Elizabeth's reign, England rose as one of the most successful monarchs. I mean, she was the most successful monarch in British history. And under her, England became a major European power in politics, in commerce, and art. Marie Curie, she founded the new science of radioactivity. Even the word radioactivity was invented by Marie Curie. Did you know that? And her discoveries launched effective cures for cancer. You all know Florence Nightingale, how she uh, processed uh, ways to treat uh, soldiers in wars who are actually suffering more from disease than from the war itself. All these things we are still using today. Uh, radioactivity, you know, there's a lot of science behind it. You know, we are using steel, we are using the modern banking system. Whatever they did at that time, we are affected today. You know, they've changed history. Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, uh, Rosa Parks, until more recently in our generation, who we have seen, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. These are all people who did something to change our course, change our lives for the better. These are men in history. They are classified as one of the greats, some of the greats. Now, looking at all these people, one of the questions that come up to our mind is, who is the greatest? You know, it's understandable all these are great people, but who is the greatest among them all? Is it Jordan or LeBron? Is it Marie Curie or Thomas Edison? Is it uh, Mother Teresa or Einstein? Rockefeller or Vanderbilt? Who is the greatest? Who has affected us the most? You know, you can go on and on on this. And one thing to note is all of these guys came from meager beginnings. They were visionaries and did something, something different that catapulted them into 
being iconic legends. Some of these guys were also Christians, like Rockefeller, a devout Christian man. Whatever he did, he did that to the glory of God. There were, some of them are really well-meaning people who all they wanted to do is make lives better. Who is the greatest? You know, as I was pondering this, and I looked at the dictionary for the word greatness, pretty much it associates with four things. <clears throat> Somebody who has a lot of power, a person's greatness is measured by the things that they have the ability to control, a person's greatness is measured by the accolades they receive, that you, could be, you, could not, you may not be an inventor, you may not be a scientist, but you are a poet who expresses things in such a way that draws people's emotions out and makes their lives different. Prestige, position, a person's greatness is measured by where they are in life, or possessions, you know, people who multiply their possessions over and over again, create ingenious ways to get things, you know, accumulate. A lot of times, a person's greatness is measured by what they accomplish, what they do. You know, and then, and as a, as a disclaimer, I want to say this. It is not wrong to seek greatness. It is not wrong to seek to serve. It is not wrong to be ambitious. But I'll come to that in a little bit. Now, during the time of Jesus, when Jesus was walking in the earth, they had a similar question. All the disciples, they were also asking, who is the greatest? Now, I understand they did not have ESPN. They didn't have Vanderbilt. They didn't have all of the those guys, they all came later. But the question that they had in mind is, who is the greatest? Now, if you turn with me to your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the middle of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Another instance I want to point out is from, uh, it's from the book of Luke, I believe. Luke 9, 46 and 47. An argument started among the disciples. This is right after Jesus is saying, okay, my death is going to be this way and resurrection and all that. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Two instances, one is where the disciples are asking Jesus, one is where they are fighting among themselves. Now, what does it mean, what is, what is Jesus trying to tell us when he says that, okay, uh, you need to turn and become like children? Now, the disciples, maybe they were thinking that, okay, I, you know, I've, we've seen Jesus do all these miracles. Not only Jesus, I have also been able to do miracles. You know, the Bible says that the disciples were able to cast out devils. The disciples were able to heal. The disciples were able to do the things that Jesus did. You know, the Bible says that not only Jesus' disciples who were walking with him, other people were also able to do this. So it is not limited to just the disciples. So disciples are wondering, okay, who's going to be the greatest? Okay, Peter, oh, he drove that demon out, but I drove 56 more out. Oh, I healed this person. That the disciples are thinking, who is the greatest? Maybe they were assuming that Jesus is going to say, Peter, boy, you walked in the water with me. You're the greatest. Oh, no, John, you love everybody. You're the greatest. Oh, Judas, because of you, we have never been bankrupt. You're the greatest. You know, the, Jesus might, I mean, they must be thinking like that. They, you have to do something to impress Jesus. You have to do something to impress God to be great. But Jesus, as usual, as usual, Jesus would always challenge people's thinking, their concept of greatness. You know, Jesus' reply that unless you become like this child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you humble yourself, you cannot be the greatest. 
You know, Jesus' statement is really saying that you desire to get positions of power and privilege. You keep comparing yourselves to each other. You keep trying to exalt one over the other. You know, if you have brothers and sisters, you may have seen this. When you're little, I mean, when you're in your teenage years like my children, they're always fighting. They're fighting to get uh, better than others. Right, Dinesh? <laughs> they're fighting to do well, do, do better. You know, oh, I'm, I'm better than him. Oh, I'm this, I'm this. Oh, you, you don't know this. You, you don't know that. All that will wear away, don't worry. But what I'm trying to say is, there's always a desire in us to be accepted. Desire enough to be, in us to be better than others. Now, Jesus says, you have to change your mindset completely. Look at this two-year-old, or look at this child. Become like him. This child is not seen as great by anybody. The child is completely dependent on his parents. Child has no influence. Child is weaker than every adult. Child cannot make money. Child has no exceptional abilities. Child has no authority and power. He just loves his father or mother. He knows, or he or she knows that they're dependent on him and delights in them. You know, the child never even thinks of themselves as compared to others. Jesus says that you need to change and become like that child. You know, Jesus is one statement, but there is a lot packed in that one statement. It is fully loaded. What does being humble like a child mean? What does it mean that you have to be like? It is not just that one verse. When you dwell on it, there is so much more. You know, I am saying this because in our own minds, we have different standards. You know, whatever it may be. The great people that I talked about earlier, Rockefellers, the Vanderbilt, the Ford, the Einsteins, the um, Marie Curie, uh, Steve Jobs, all these are great people. But God the Father created this, these great people. And that God the Father is telling us there is a higher standard. You know, as a, as a believer, we should aspire for greatness. We should aspire to do all these things that these great people have done. As a believer, greatness lives inside me. And because of that, I should aspire to be great. I should aspire to excellence in my work, in my everything. I should aspire for excellence. If, if people at work say, Reggie, do this, can you do this? I should go above and beyond. Not to impress any other, anybody else, but to impress God who's my boss. You see, your greatness, your understanding of greatness should be based on what God thinks is greatness. Now, the God who made all these people, God who's bigger than all the greats, he says, we need to be like little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom is the one who is humble like a child. Wow. There's a lot packed in that verse. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 13 and 14, it says, Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them, and Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Keep that in mind. Matthew eleven twenty five, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. So what is it about children that secrets are revealed? What is it about children that God accepts them? What is it about children that God is impressed what is it about children that God taught them as examples for the disciples who's been walking with them, with Jesus every day? Why a child? You know, a lot of you know I love to work with children. Give me a chance and I'll spend the day with children. You know, one thing that really impresses me and feeds my soul is the innocence of children. You know, when you, when you talk to a child, when you engage with a child in conversation or an activity, you know, it never ceases to amaze me. You know, every child is different. Every child does things differently. Every child processes things differently. But there are the baseline of all that is innocence. You know, when I see innocence in a child, it just, it just soothes my soul. It just satisfies. It just brings, 
it just brings a, such a calm in my life, thinking that, God, I was innocent like that one time. We were all innocent like that one time. The innocence of a child, you know, is something that is valued. You know, okay, I'll, I have something in mind that I want to talk about later. The child is really filled with awe and wonder. You do anything, you know, some of you must have seen that after the Friday night service, I do a magic thing here with the little children. Don't tell your children what that is, but they are so impressed, you know, and they long to see me come back and do some more tricks. By the time the child is like seven or eight, they know what I'm doing. <laughs> and they graduate and they are not in my, they, they become my magic staff. They don't become my audience, I mean, they're not my audience anymore. But I enjoy that. I mean, the, the awe, the eyes. Oh, how did that happen? How did that magic happen? You know, I mean, they're always in such awe. They hold me in awe. Okay? I am saying, we, the God who has healed the lame, the God who has healed the sick, God who has raised the dead, God who has created the universe, the little molecules, oh, everything. We ought to hold God in awe. This is no magic trick. It is like permanent. A child is able to do that. A child is able to continuously hold God in awe. Or hold, hold their parents in awe. We have to hold continuously God in awe. Parents are the heroes for a child. Anything that a parent does, a child is like, oh man, the parents are everything. Uh, a child does not wear... A mask, no pun intended. A child does not wear a wall. It does not wear uh, faces. You know, they're not something else in front of people and something else at home or inside. They are what they are. A child is vulnerable. When I say a child does not wear a mask, I mean, I'm not saying you don't wear masks. I mean, this is a new thing now. But uh, you wear the physical mask. What I'm saying is you don't wear a face. Child is vulnerable. Child is not somebody who forms judgment, who is not judgmental. Child is filled admiration for the mother and father, trusting, forgiving, loyal, faithful, you name it. Anything that relates to innocence, a child is. You know, one thing that comes to mind is that, remember, um, remember in the word, Jesus is traveling and he comes to a point where there are hordes of people, 5,000, know, 5,000 plus actually, hordes of people, and uh, everybody's come to see the miracle worker. Every, Jesus has worked miracle. He has healed the lame. He has opened blind eyes. He has, people who are deaf, they could hear. And everyone has come there just to see Jesus. Jesus is speaking. And so much so, it crosses lunchtime. And it's about noon, it says. And Jesus is like, can we give these guys some food? 5,000 people and disciples are like, okay, uh, food. Out of the 5,000 people, the Bible records, one child comes and says, here's my five loaves and two fishes. Church, you really think if that one child has five loaves and two fishes, you really think out of the 5,000, maybe 10 adults may have had some food with them? Maybe 15 adults may have some food with them? The adult did not come, in front, uh, come forward, but the child did. The child may have heard, the mother must have said, oh, go and see Jesus. Oh, he healed that man in Bethsaida. No, not only that, you know, at that wedding in Cana. Oh, did you remember? I mean, I saw that with my own eyes. The child must have been taught. He turned water into wine. You know, that house in our cousin's house, uh, then Jesus was there and he was meeting everybody and there was no room to go in and few people broke the roof and they lowered a, uh, a, a sick man down and Jesus healed them. So a child probably must have heard all this. He's come and he's listening to Jesus. Jesus asks, does anybody have any food? Child says, okay, I have five loaves and two fishes. No adult, a child. Why is it? It is very simple for a child, like the Bible says, like I read. It is very simple for a child to receive things from God. It is very easy for a child to be obedient, to be trusting. Because none of the other nonsense is in the child's mind. So, can we, can we be like that, church? I'm, I'm, I know I'm preaching, but I'm talking to you. Can we be like that, where I can be like that child, who can be trusting, who can be obedient? I can be like that child, 
who is willing to give all, not thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to fill my tummy? Another example that comes to mind is Abraham. You know, Abraham was very comfortable in his land in Ur. And God says, Abraham, come on, let's get out of Ur. And Abe, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Abraham did not even know where God is taking him. Abraham did not see the land. But Abraham obeyed God without any questions. Abraham went ahead and you know what happened later. Many, many, many years later, Abraham got a promise from the Lord saying that, okay, your wife is going to bury your child. And many years after that, uh, Sarai, uh, she bore a child. And many years after that, God says, Abraham, now we're going to sacrifice your child. Without any question, Abraham says, okay, God, we will do it. Obedience leading to trust, leading to sacrifice, just like a child. Abraham is one of those examples where you can say he was like a child all the time. You know, another example that comes, uh, regard, a child is faithful, right? In the sense, you take a child to the park, the child will come back with you at home. The child is not saying, okay, mom, dad, bye. These are my new friends, I'm going with them. A child is always loyal. One, one instance that reminds me is like, I have the privilege of working with your children in the, uh, in the kids' church. And sometimes when I do Bible studies, I, some of the answers that the children give me, some of your children equate you to God. Parents, if you do not know that, if you're worried about, you know, your child would love you or not, I want to give you feedback. Some of your parents, uh, some of your children think that you are perfect. Think that you, there is no one like you. They think like that you are next to God. So please make something good for them tonight. Because uh, they are, they are precious and they really hold you in high esteem. A child is loyal. A child is faithful. You say, I, I don't, I wouldn't dare to say anything bad about you parents to your children. Because they will fight me. So, Joseph had a lot of chances to uh, go against God. Nobody was even watching in the prison when he was a slave or even with Potiphar's wife. Nobody was even watching. But Joseph was faithful. Joseph was loyal. Can we do that, church? Next point is humility. This is one of the greatest you know, in the eyes of God, Abraham and Joseph were already great before they became famous. They humbled themselves like a little child. They were already doing the things that the Lord intended them to do. You know, one of our Bible studies, I think it was called to mention, the gifts do not show maturity. The fruits do. If you are wondering, you know, am I mature in the Lord? How much should I? Just judge yourself. The Bible says you judge yourself. The fruits do, not the gifts. Abraham and Joseph were already great even before they rose to greatness in front of the world. In God's eyes, you humble yourself like a child. You're great. You're the greatest. Now, what is the de definition of humility? Now, I'm coming to the core of my message. Humility is a, is a quality where you would put others first. That you would put yourself behind and elevate somebody else. I would put you in front and I would debase myself. Even though you have the utmost ability to do things, you are skilled in this, skilled in that, you are a director, manager, owner, whatever, humility is saying that God, you are everything, I am nothing. God, others are better than me. Say, so God, I exalt you and I put myself down. You are great and you are great alone. That is humility. God wants us to be like that. You know, along with humility is packed forgiveness as well. If I am not able to forgive somebody, I have to check if I'm really humble. If I'm able to forgive, if, I'm able to, if somebody offends me, and I'm able to say, God, I will not take any offense. God, who am I? I'm nothing. I'm able to forgive. 
That is humility. That's part of humility. Church, at this time, I talked about innocence. You have to keep in mind that there is a way to protect your innocence. Anybody says anything bad about anybody, you walk away. There is no need to listen. You see something on TV that is not of God, walk away. There is no need to watch it. There is a temptation to lash out to another brother or a sister, you walk away. There is no need for that. God will justify you. God will vindicate you. There is a lot in that verse. Unless you are like, humble like a child, you cannot be the greatest. Now, why should I look for greatness? Church, God created the earth and the only reason for man and woman was to glorify God by delighting in Him, by taking a lot of joy in Him. But man rejected that purpose. Man wanted to glorify himself. Man looked at greatness for himself. Oh, if only I have that property there, if only I have that car there, that plane there, if only I do this, then I will be great in people's eyes. Or if I only drive this car, or if I only this house, or if I only buy a house in this uh, place, or if I only rose up to be the director of a company, anything, then I'll be great. You know, God's desire is different. God's desire is not that. In all our sin, God sent a son for us. He died for us so that we can, you know, be part of the kingdom. And God is going to create a new heaven and new earth. In that new heaven and new earth, there is no one great except for God. Our only intent of, our, of us being created is to worship God, to glorify Him. And we will do that when we go to heaven. So, in heaven, no one will seek greatness for himself. No one will argue about who is the greatest. Instead, we will all rejoice in the greatness of God and of His Son. We will see Greatness that comes only from God. That is the goal of the gospel church. The good news is God is great, everyone else is not. Only God is great. Only God is great. There's no one else. The greatest of the greatest is God. If we understand that, the Bible says, if we humble ourselves and understand that, I am God calls me the greatest. So, keeping all this in mind, what greatness are we aspiring for, church? Is my idea of greatness recognition? Is my idea of greatness accomplishment? Is my idea of greatness, uh, oh, nobody, I, I will not let anybody argue with me. I will win every argument. Is my idea of greatness, oh, I have to have these possessions. Is my idea of greatness just to get the best deal? You know, some of us do brag about that. Oh, I found this the greatest deal I could ever find. Some of us, when we talk, we only talk about deals. Do you know that? Where, where do I... I mean, is that all? Where is our measure of greatness? You know, if you think greatness is that, everything, everything that you do will point towards that. If you think God is great... And only He can give me greatness through His blood, through His Son, and I become humble, then everything I do will, all my aspirations, all my ambitions will point towards that. Now, you know, John Piper says kingdom greatness reveals a character and genius of God. The greatest among us are those who love and serve others most. You know, Kingdom principles are different from worldly principles. You already know that. If you want to receive, you give. If you want to be high, you become low. You want to be a leader, you become a slave. So kingdom greatness is so different. You know, you want, to, you want love, you love first. Do unto others that others will do unto you. Seek ye the kingdom of God and everything else will be. So kingdom greatness is different. And we need to think about that. Now, the next one, I really want to go fast because I have only one minute left, I think. Humility is not a character trait to be developed. It is a byproduct of walking in the presence of the Almighty God. Now, you may be asking, how do I become humble? Or what do I do to become humble? You know, there is nothing like that. If you are in the presence of God constantly, the Spirit of God will remind you 
as to who God is. And that will keep you humble. If you know, you know that when you have conversations with people, in the thinking that you have, you know that God is watching. You know God is looking at you. If you go in that attitude everywhere, humility will follow you. You know, before, a few months ago, before COVID, we were doing awesome in terms of the economy. Wealth increased, unemployment at its lowest. In half a century, people were traveling places, people were getting promoted left, right, and center. Bonuses increased, people were buying things. Seemed like everything was running so fast that people did not have time to eat dinner together. You know, two months later, and everything has changed so much. Slowed down so tremendously, and now there is fear, insecurity. Oh, my job, you know, money, sadness. And many minds are even thinking in survival mode. You know, it is a time to become real, church. It is a time where we say, you know, forget all this. Let's come to the core of our existence. Let's come to reality. What does God want of us? We have to completely realign our mind to be dependent on our father. A child is dependent on the father. A child is dependent on the mother. A child is dependent for guidance. A child is dependent for food. A child is dependent on the mom and dad for stability. A child is dependent on the mom and dad for everything else. A child is dependent, a dependent, dependent, dependent. And that is what God is calling us to be, a child. You know, last night and the night before we saw all these riots on TV, uh, I even saw people uh, burning shops, uh, or not burning, burning dumpsters, breaking into shops and leaving. You know, some of the establishments in downtown, they hired their own security. They didn't believe the cops could keep them safe. That They had their own security with like machine guns and all that standing outside. The mob did not touch them, but all the other stores they ransacked, pillaged, robbed and stole. All this because of the mistake of one uh, police officer. Now, if you think that we should pray now because of all this that happened, then we are fooling ourselves. This is a problem we've had throughout. This is just a manifestation of that problem. We have to pray all the time. Imagine if more than half of those people knew the Lord. Would this ever have happened? Church, imagine if all these people who gathered to pillage and all that, if they had been given the gospel, if they had known the Lord, would this ever happen? Many a times, these things kind of wake us up to the call that, oh man, there is need for prayer. Yes, there is. But I'm saying, when things subside, when things calm down, and nobody's pillaging, nobody is robbing, stealing, uh, burning things, we don't stop to pray. We continue knowing that the root is still there. Evil is still there. Evil exists. And as long as evil exists, we cannot cease praying. You know, I want to also rem- remind you, Prayer is our responsibility. Miracles are God's. If we don't pray, miracles won't happen. If we don't pray, changes won't occur. So the 40-day prayer is something that you have to keep in mind, church. At this time, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples gathered in the upper room in anticipation. Like children filled with innocence and admiration for the Father. The Spirit of God descended like cloven tongues of fire. The disciples gathered in the other upper room, filled with anticipation, like the child, filled with innocence, acknowledging, God, you've done so much. Jesus, they nailed you to the cross, and you died, and you rose again. Oh, not only that, Jesus, you also came down, and you appeared to so many people. You walked through walls, and not only that, you were just not an image. We could even touch you. We could even see your wounds. People were in, Jesus, uh, disciples were in awe of who Jesus was. All they wanted to do was pray and wait on God. They just, they even sold everything. They, all they wanted was God. When they were sitting like children in that place, in anticipation, in anticipation of who God is, in the anticipation of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God came down like tongues of fire. Church, will you do that today? 
wherever you are in the sanctuary of your home wherever you are sitting in front of your tv computer or dining table wherever you are would you i know it is an extra step would you kneel down and say god i am nothing with all this covid business that is going on and everything else god i am nothing you are everything god i need you i need you more than anything else oh lord where can i go from your spirit oh lord god where can i run from your presence even if i make my bed in hell you're there your right hand shall hold me lord you will pick me up church can we do that you know i we cannot see you you can see yourself your family can see yourself take this time as a time of devotion to the lord god almighty and say god i come i humble myself as a child lord i want to forgive everyone who I have an offense against god i have nothing oh god lord whatever i am it is you and you alone oh father all these things that are happening in our lives today oh lord god father we just want to get out of it but lord we need you and you alone father we come in anticipation we hold you in high esteem saying god you are great and greatly to be praised i lay down everything that i have lord people who i have offended god i'm sorry i have not been like a child oh god i am sorry lord i want to forgive god i don't want to be like this adult who does not care about you and who you are lord i want to be like a child lord i want to be humble i want to give others more credence more importance lord i want to esteem you high and great father i need you father i need you church can we do that as a sign as a sign of your love and your anticipation sign of your love and your repentance sign of your humility let's bow down church together you know desperate times call for desperate steps if you never knelt down and you know if you're physically able please don't take that as symbolic of anything i'm saying take take that as a step of humo- humility say god i just want to worship you lord i just want to bow down to god in this house of mine in this apartment of mine and i want to say god you are great and no one else god i am nothing you are the bread giver oh god i am not the bread winner oh god i will give you all the glory god you are my boss no one else god i repent to god if i have sinned lord i have repent if i meditated on things that are not supposed to be of yours god i repent can we say that church can we say that together even as a team leads us in a song worship you father